joining us. We're going to do one of the two things that I promised we would do at the end of the last uh, hour uh, and not the other. I'm going to table what's wrong with radio, what's wrong with talk radio, and what is plaguing talk radio uh, during tomorrow's show. But we are going to listen to what uh, Dwight, who is calling in from Dallas, has to say. I understand, Dwight, that you have a question. Yes, sir. I have an acquaintance, mm-hmm. and uh, she says that she's an evangelist. Uh, I think she's part of the, uh, the uh, Black Hebrew Roots Movement. And, but she Uh-oh. claims that. Uh, <laughs> but she Uh-oh. claims that. Uh, yeah, well. I, what's what's I, that done, that old I'm movie? I'm worried about that. I'm just. Yeah. Uh, I, danger, I, I danger. Yeah. 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 But uh, she says that the name. Of course, the strong concord of the name of Yahweh should be uh, Ahia. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. It, it's amazing how people will uh, profess to be an expert by checking one source. It's like a person who has one watch, thinks they know what time it is, and a person that has three watches knows that they don't know what time it is, <laughs> you know, because they all have something different to say. Strong concordance has value. I don't want to dish it and say it has absolutely no value. It does have some value. Uh, the problem with strong concordance is it was uh, written to support, to justify the translations in the King James. So the strong concordance exists to justify the King James translations. Uh, so whatever the King James the version chose as a uh, as a definition for a word. That's what you'll find supported in uh, in Strong's, and they really have never moved away from that. So you have to be really careful with uh, with Strong's. It is there is a lot of misinformation in it. Uh, the uh, Yahweh has but one name. Uh, Strong's. It doesn't matter what Strong says. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what anybody says. Yahweh in his Torah, Prophets, and Psalms says he has but one name. And he spells it yod he wah Y-H-W-H. And he tells us that it's his only name. He actually provides his name 7,000 times. And he says, I don't have any other name. That's, I only have this one name. So when Strong says that his uh, name, and they, they uh, are providing a title here, um, <laughs> that would be ludicrous. Now, Strong's will tell you that, that yod he wah is, uh, is typically pronounced uh, Yahweh. Uh, it's by those who just haven't bothered to do their their due diligence to uh, to study. Um, but no, it's uh, God tells us seven thousand times that His name is Yahweh. I suspect that the Creator of the universe and the Architect of life, the fellow that figured out how to make DNA, uh, which is a language, a three dimensional language, uh, uh, conceive and replicate life. I think there's just a slim possibility that the designer of DNA can spell his own name. Right. What do you think? So that, I think you're right. But, <laughs> yeah. So there's no way that she can get a higher from Y H. No. A higher sounds like a, uh, a a person trying to say uh, Ohio with a southern accent. You're from Ohio? <laughs> no, no. It's Y H W H. The Y in in Hebrew is is pronounced like the Y in English. And in English, they both a W and a Y are are consonant vowels. Y's and W's are both used as vowels and consonants, and uh, which means a vowel is an open mouth sound, a consonant is a closed mouth sound. There's no great uh, secret in terms of the, the grammatical uh, denotation, in terms of the alphabetical sounds. But uh, y- Yod's, uh, Yah, the first letter in Yahweh's name, the Y, but permeates the Hebrew alphabet. I mean, it's, it's one of the most commonly used letters throughout the alphabet, and it is consistently in every word pronounced as we would pronounce a Y in English. So there's no secret there. And the uh, the He and, and uh, Hebrew, what I did to determine how to pronounce it is I'm not the most uh, sophisticated thinker in the world. I figured, all right, there's there's uh, about 10,000 words that are used in the, uh, the uh, Hebrew lexicon. I'm just going to go through, and I'm going to look at every single word. And I'm going to look how the hey is pronounced. And what I found is that 99.9% of the time that a hey is found in a Hebrew word, like Torah. Torah ends in the Hebrew hey. That it's pronounced ah. And so if you find that 99% 
of Hebrew words that contain the hey is pronounced ah, then you now know how to pronounce two of the four letters in Yahweh's name, right? And we know how to pronounce the Y because it's just like Yisrael, for example, is is Y, is what it begins with. Uh, so th that's all really simple. And then the only question is becomes the uh, the Y, and I did the same thing. I looked uh, just I systematically over a period of a week. I looked at every single Hebrew word that contains a law, and I found that about 80% of the laws are pronounced as a, like it is in Torah, uh, and like it is in Shalom, and that about 20% of the laws are pronounced with a, a U sound, but then I began to realize that the U sound is not well supported. Uh, for example, it's Yahudim is how they would pronounce uh, the the designation of Jews uh, would be Yahudim. Uh, po and the the Yahu would be from the Hebrew law. But if you look at the Hebrew words that are like Yoel, uh, like Yob, uh, they are all contractions of the of Yao, the first part of Yahweh's name. Right. And and so when you see, and there's like 75 of them that began like Yoel, which means Yah was God. And so there's so much evidence, including all the most common Hebrew words that where the was is pronounced as an O. Uh, it's, uh, it's overwhelmingly likely, particularly with the names like Yoel, Yah was God, that... It's uh, Yahweh. Uh, and what I will tell people is say, listen, I am absolutely certain of the Y and the H. Absolutely certain. There is, there is zero chance that the Y or the H is being pronounced incorrectly in Yahweh. Zero. There is a chance, probably about uh, 5 to 10 percent, that the Y would be pronounced as a U. But I negate that because all of the most common Hebrew words that we know the pronunciation, the wa has the O sound. And since uh, uh, Yahweh takes the shortened form of his name and makes many names out of it like Yoel, Yob, that it's uh, obvious that, that he intended the O sound. That I think the likelihood is probably under 5% that the U sound prevails. So that's the that's the best answer I can give you. And, and Yahweh included his name in his Torah Prophets and Psalms, uh, Dwight, exactly 7,000 times, and I am absolutely certain that he knows how to spell his own name. So it seems like he's trying to make the, the Y uh, silent. Yeah, I don't know why anybody would make the Y silent. Not, the y, why, y, yeah, why is not even silent in, uh, in English? I mean, the Y is not silent in, in any uh, alphabet. Mm-hmm. Sounds like sounds like the little uh, boy or girl that was playing hide and seek and then uh, jumps out from behind the curtain and says, "Ah ha ha! Here I am! I fooled you!" No, uh, I. And by the way, Strong doesn't say that that's how it's pronounced. All right, so, um, uh, Strong's has got a lot of misnomers. There's a lot of errant material in Strong's, but. Uh, uh, they don't claim that it's pronounced ah ha ha. <laughs> so no, it's really it's really not complicated. All you got to do is is look at the all of the other words in the Hebrew uh, language, all of which are written with the same 22 letters. And when you do that, you'll quickly recognize that there's five vowels in Hebrew, just as there's five vowels in English, and that all those vowels are consistently pronounced throughout the Hebrew lexicon. You know, it's, this idea that you can't pronounce Yahweh's name is, is just idiotic, because that would be saying, well, then you can't pronounce any word that has those five letters in it, and yet uh, those four letters in it, and yet those letters are in <laughs> most every Hebrew word, <laughs> which means you, <laughs> you couldn't pronounce any of the language, which means when God was speaking his Torah to his uh, children, it means he couldn't pronounce it. When Moshe read it, he couldn't pronounce it. <laughs> it would mean when God says, listen to my voice, that would mean that he would just be uh, playing a cool trick on us because none of it could be uh, pronounced. So, <laughs> religious right. stupidity, my friend uh, Dwight. That's the uh, that's the answer. Yeah. Well, thank you again, sir. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You don't need to call me sir, though. But uh, you're welcome. My my pleasure. I'm glad right. you're listening, thank and you I'm glad you're uh, interested.
<laughs> Thank you, Dwight. All right, I'd like to uh, return to where we were in the midst of our analysis of Yahshua. We're in the 18th chapter where God is, uh, has just completed uh, issuing a, a warning to a condemnation of the United States. So there's something that the United States has done that has harmed his reputation, has harmed Israel, that God is really annoyed by. And um, there's a lot of things we've discussed what many of those things are that has got God so angry at the United States of America. So at this moment in time, God is saying, all right, I've given my warning to America. I've cleansed my uh, land of the invading millions of Muslim jihadists. I have revealed to the world my banner, who I am. I've taken my the statements that I've etched in stone and I've made it so the whole world can see them, so my testimony is known. I've, uh, I was personally involved in ridding the promised land of, the, uh, of 150 million, in all likelihood, Muslims. And now I've, uh, I've sounded my uh, trumpet, my ram's horn shofar, so that everyone in the world, and I put up these signs and symbols and, and texts and messages so everyone in the world is without excuse. So I have done what I said I was going to do. I've honored my promises. I've revealed myself. And now, it's all up to you. At that point, he's going to leave the adversary and human institutions to do what they will to the earth. It's going to be very deliberate in Daniel. It's going to be three and a half years. For three and a half years, God is going to be nowhere to found here on the planet. Um, and the earth is going to be divided into those who have decided to accept what he was offering through his covenant and learn it from his Torah, and those who are opposed to him, and the vast preponderance of people will be opposed to him. But for the next three and a half years, God's going to say, you know, I'm just not going to have anything to do with you. It should make, it'd make my life miserable to have to deal with you. And the last thing God wants to do is micromanage. He doesn't want to thwart volition. It's only three and a half more years of that people will be making these choices. And the fact of the matter is that once somebody accepts the mark of the beast, you know, three sixes uh, for the three human institutions that are the most uh, deadly, uh, human religious institutions, human political institutions, and human economic institutions, that once that's imposed on people and they decide to decide with the beast, uh, then choice is over for them. So is their fate. <laughs> Speaking of this time, this time where Yahweh is going to focus on his family as opposed to human decadence, human destruction, the statement reads, and I will look, choosing to be observant in my dwelling place, in the manner of radiant and glowing, warm and passionate light, akin to an enveloping cloud of encompassing dew and the warmth and enthusiasm of the harvest. What God is telling us is that um, as bad as the first three and a half years of the tribulation have been, with war after war and death upon death, carnage upon carnage, utter destruction of this planet, billions of people dead, that the last three and a half years will be worse. He's telling us, however, that uh, he's not going to participate. That the horrible effects of the tribulation are not God judging the world, but instead the world acting badly. He is going to enjoy his children. And he is going to be true to himself. In his dwelling place, heaven, like radiant and glowing, warm and passionate light, He's going to enjoy his children, which he has transformed into light. Like an enveloping cloud of encompassing dew in the warmth and enthusiasm of the harvest. He's talking about spending quality time with his children, many of whom he has just reaped from the planet. 
So he now is going to dispatch his spirit to remove the plague of Islam from his land. He will dispatch his envoy to stop the world's militaries in the midst of a horrible and hellish storm, leaving no doubt among his people or the world at large that he can be relied upon to protect those he loves. But once this is accomplished, Yahweh will spend the rest of the tribulation in a better place, quiet in heaven, at peace, removed from the strife that will ensue. Doing what he asks of us, and thus leading by example, he will be observant, always aware, as he contemplates his next move, one that expresses his heart's desire. In just a few years, he will be beaming, radiant, glowing, enjoying the warm embrace of his children. The promise he has made to Abraham and Ishak will soon come to fruition, just three years hence, on the joyous day known as Yom Kippur, the day of reconciliations, the final and most beloved harvest. Now this is how the Torah and prophets present Yahweh as our Heavenly Father. He's warm and approachable, encompassing, glowing light. He cannot wait to hold his children in his arms. He wants to be as close to them as the dew is to the standing grain. He is looking forward to this time with his family, as opposed to dreading what humanity will do to itself during the waning years of the tribulation. I have long suspected that the tormenting and terrible abuses endured during this upcoming tribulation will be perpetrated by man and not God. And this prophetic statement seems to affirm that conclusion. Yahweh rarely intervenes and only acts to fulfill his promises. He made an eternal pledge to Abraham, whereby the benefits of the covenant would be everlasting. Had he not intervened to thwart mankind's assault against his people and his land, that pledge would have been negated, something that God will not allow. Bringing these thoughts together, along with a review of the events and villains which have brought us to this place, here's what we have thus far. Woe, expressing dissatisfaction and a warning to the land of whirling and buzzing wings, which is from a region beyond, situated on the opposite side of the directions of the rivers of Kush in the Nile Delta and northern Mesopotamia. It dispatches envoys by way of the sea, and so in floating vessels on the surface of the waters, the messengers travel swiftly, indulgently, and immorally without any regard for the consequences of their mission. This nation of people from different races and places is tall, often intoxicated, and immodest, and they have a propensity to take things away from others. They are scrubbed clean, smooth-skinned, and completely shaven, and yet typically reckless. These people are feared for causing distress through intimidation and awesome and dreadful acts, but they are also respected by some for their achievements and their capabilities from here to there and beyond in a future time. This population is comprised of many different races, and it routinely vomits up and spews out nonsense in a strange foreign language, talking down to others, mocking them, while continuously marching off to war. We'll return after the commercial break. We're considering Yahweh's uh, testimony regarding uh, America, and he talked about this population, which is comprised of many different races, routinely vomits up and spews out nonsense in a strange foreign language, talking down to others, mocking them, while continuously marching off to war based upon uh, their condescending and moronic rhetoric, always trying to impose its influence, establishing the rules, while eagerly expecting to throw inhabitants out of their land. It aggressively subdues others, trampling them down. This is a country divided by rivers. All of those who inhabit the earth and also those who dwell in the land, when the sign of the on the upright pole is lifted up, 
to demonstrate my purpose on my mountain, you will all actually see, gaining a perspective to genuinely understand. And also, when the shofar, ram's horn, trumpet, is sounds, sounded at this specific time, it will be designed to convey this plan. You will all be able to listen, even to pay attention. Indeed, because here and now, at this point in time, says Yahweh, as for me, I will be silent and at peace, removed from the tribulation in a better place. Then I will look, choosing to always be observant, anticipating my desired, unending, and caring response, where I and heaven will benefit. In my dwelling place, from the well-known location and space where the universe was established, which is the basis for and the foundation of life, in a manner radiant and glowing, warm and passionate, a manner of light like this, akin to an enveloping cloud of encompassing dew in the warmth and enthusiasm of the harvest. Now, while this is wonderful news for the children of the covenant, and especially for Yisrael and Yahuda, sadly, Yahweh had some more bad news for the land across the sea divided by rivers, for the air and sea power of this day, for the nation feared and revered, and yet insignificant and worthless from God's perspective. They will be dealt with, taken down, and destroyed just before the final harvest, during the time Israelites are being prepared to embrace the covenant. Let's listen to what God has to say. Indeed, before the approaching presence of the harvest, as the budding blossoms form and become completely perfect, then the hardened and unfit will be dealt with. For becoming clusters of wild birds of prey, glistening eagles and falcons and hawks, and the insignificant and worthless who squander and trivialized will be stopped. They'll be taken down and banished. They'll be stuffed out with a sharp implement. So then, with regard to the forsaken castaways, they will be completely rejected and removed, cut off, and separated. Yasha Yah, salvation is from Yahweh, Isaiah 18.5. So in contrast to God's warm and compassionate, embracing nature and light in heaven with his children, God is telling us that there are others that are in opposition to him. And he says, as we approach the final harvest, which will be Yom Kippur, as the budding blossoms are forming and the tender shoots are becoming ready to be reconciled unto Yahweh, there will be those pontificating religion and government and military and economic schemes. And just as the budding blossoms form and become perfect, ready for the final harvest, ready for the reconciliation promised by Yom Kippur, the day of reconciliations, there will also be the hardened and unfit the immature, unharvestable, and especially sour. It's from Bosser. Yahweh makes it clear, something that should be obvious to us, that a religious person is hard-headed. They're unfit. That they are unharvestable. They are incapable of being saved. I'm going back and forth today with a good friend of mine who is promoting a, uh, a religious uh, individual who is um, pontificating all manner of deceptions. And, and he mixes a little truth in with his uh, lies. And, and I wants me to engage in discussion with him. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Look at Yosha. He never, ever succeeded in talking with the religious or political. Those who are... Overtly religious and political can't be helped. They are unharvestable. They're hard-headed. From God's perspective, they are especially sour. Yosha never once approached them because he knew it would be a waste of time. He did respond to them. You know, when a religious person comes into our midst, as uh, we had the other day with the fellow promoting Messianic Judaism and the Hebrew words movement, we're going to confront them. And Yosha did. Now, he didn't confront them for the benefit 
of the lost soul, the soul promoting the religious or political or economic myths. Because there's no evidence that any of them walked away from their religion and changed, and then came to embrace Yahweh and his Torah. He rebuked them for us, for those of us who aren't religious, for those of us who are open-minded, for those of us who can benefit from sane instruction. But here God is saying that those who are hard-headed and unfit, they're unharvestable. Well, sir, you're wasting your time to try to reach them. God said they're going to be dealt with. And they're going to be dealt with as clusters for the wild birds of prey, for the glistening eagles and falcons and hawks, unclean yet shimmering vultures or a collection of wild sprigs and a budding plant structure. And the signif insignificant and the worthless who squander and trivialize. The despised sprigs and contemptuous trindles. The gluttonous, the vile, the meaningless. Those who will sell you a book of lies to promote themselves. They're going to be stopped. Taken down and banished. They will be severed, cut off, and excluded. He seen to exist, having failed. They will be destroyed, snuffed out with a sharp implement. Ba has Mosmera, an iron tool used to cut away, to put out, to separate. No longer combusting. Their fires will be put out. Then, with regard to the forsaken castaways, they will be completely rejected and totally removed, cut off and separated. But say, I'm not going to grade on a curve here. I'm not going to compromise. I'm not going to accept everyone into heaven. You're either in accord with the Torah's instructions regarding the conditions of the covenant, and you're part of my family, or you are not. And somebody who might just mean well but is completely lost in this regard is not going to be allowed into heaven. They are excluded. I mean, it's something that, that far too few people appreciate, that God has to exclude them from heaven. If he did not exclude them from heaven, then heaven would become nothing different than hell, that it would become another cesspool of religious and political maneuverings and military and economic schemes. And God's not going to endure that for all eternity. At that point, there would be no place to retreat from them. And so it's just not going to happen. They will be excluded. God must take that approach to be consistent, to be fair, to be dependable. We have Daniel, who has called in from St. Louis, as a follow-up question from last week's uh, call. And hello, Daniel. Welcome back to the program. Thank you, Yada. Um, well, I had to take a rain check on meeting with... Um, my parents and their their pastor this week. It was supposed to be on Thursday, and we had some uh, some vicious weather in the morning, and then um, uh, we're supposed to be vicious again in the evening, but it ended up kind of passing over, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. so I had to take a literal rain check on that. Right. Um, okay. But but uh, my mom had texted me a couple things, and I I don't know if you'd, you'd want me to share them with you or not, but they were kind of interesting, and I tried to put your your advice. And a friend of mine who I had over who told me, you're not going to get anywhere with them. They're going to make you look like a ding-dong. And oh, they, will make, they will make you look like a ding-dong. They will accuse you of being a ding-dong. There is yeah. no way to make God's testimony uh, stupid. There is no way yeah. to, oh, I know that. to, uh, to uh, play God for the fool. Uh, so they, they will make you appear like you're a nutcase uh, yeah. for, for advocating that which uh, God advocates. But all they're doing is really besmirching themselves and, and, and trying to besmirch God in the, uh, in the right. process. Uh, the friend of yours who told you that you will not prevail with, uh, with, with religious individuals, particularly with a, a pastor who makes his living being religious, is correct. Uh, yeah, we talked about this. Yeah, we, we talked about this uh, a week or so ago, Daniel, when I, I told you that, yeah. that never once, never once did Yasha seek out religious and political leaders. And I agree, you're right. Never once. Never once did he set an appointment to meet with a religious or a political leader. Never once. 
And he's my example. And he's your example. And second of all, when he was confronted by them, he was consistent. He always exposed and condemned them. <laughs> but there's not a single case where he, where his willingness to expose and condemn them when they confronted him led to their salvation. Never once. Sure. Right. Now, he is a whole lot more articulate, knowledgeable, and persuasive than you and I are. Oh, yes. And he was never successful at causing a religious or political individual to admit that they were wrong and to embrace the truth. So you have to say, now, why would it benefit anyone, then, for him to respond to those who confronted him? And that's because there are those of us who are open to the truth, who are open to his example, who want to know. And so when we witness Yahusha and Yahweh lash out at religious and political leaders, calling them corrupt and hypocrites, uh, then we know that God hates religion. So there's a, there's a benefit. Now, for you in that situation, what I shared with you then is that Unless you were to have a forum for exposing the stupidity of the religious person's uh, antagonism towards the word of Yahweh, there really isn't an advantage in doing so. Um, you know, if you have, if you have, like Yosha had, the ability to communicate what was discussed for the whole world to witness, then there's a reason to make an example out of them. We'll return, uh, Daniel. Stay with us. With Shattering Miss picks up after the commercial break. Welcome back to Shattering Miss. We're talking to Daniel from St. Louis, who's going to have a, a uh, meeting with, uh, uh, I believe it's your parents, and also with uh, uh, their pastor to demonstrate the foolishness of of Christianity and why Yahweh wants us to walk away from uh, religion in particular, but of course Christianity uh, uh, especially. And uh, you were preparing to do that. I, I want to inter say one other thing, then I want you to have the floor again, Daniel, is that earlier this week I had the opportunity to uh, to listen to uh, um, a religious advocate, the fellow that was advocating the Hebrew Roots Movement. What I tried to do was follow Yosha's example. If you If you read any one of Yosha's uh, experiences with uh, religious and political individuals. First of all, he did not seek them. He only responded to them. And so I didn't seek this fellow out. In fact, I was asked uh, this morning if I wanted to interview an author that is promoting four blood moons. And I said, no, I don't want to, to invite them uh, into a confrontation. I will confront them if they come to the program, if they come to me, following Yosha's example. The second thing was, I let the guy make his points. He made six points. And then I systematically refuted his points without giving him the opportunity to uh, to wallow in his uh, religious uh, mythology. If you read Yosha's examples, it's exactly the same. Once he is confronted by the religious and political types, he unloads on them and systematically demonstrates why what they believe is uh, is errant and denounces them for their inconsistencies between what they say and what God says but he does not entertain their justifications thereafter. Yeah. So a pretty good example. I, I, Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say the friend that I had talked to, um, and you had mentioned something about this last week also, was, um, I guess, understanding. He said, you know, the only reason that you should have the pastor there talking is so that you can tell him that you want to heal the relationship between you and your parents and so that you can learn how to communicate with each other. And I thought that was... Yeah, that's, that wasn't my yeah, point. Yeah, but, that but, awesome, but, 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 nah, yeah, but guess what? No. Yosha was very clear on this. He says, I came to bring division. And he says, I came to yeah, bring division know. between they parents and children and, and, uh, and siblings. And, and so I, what, what you know about the Torah, about Yahweh, about his covenant, is extremely unpopular and divisive, particularly in a religious community. Yeah, and so it's not going to bring healing. It's going to bring division. 
Yeah. One more thing before I know we don't have a lot of time, but I was I was unavailable earlier today. I kind of wanted to call in and go through a, a text message that my mom had sent me in a conversation that we had had through text that uh, ended with her saying, "I'm done. I'm done discussing religion with you. Basically, I'm not going to meet with her and her pastor, which is probably for the better." Yes, for that. I was trying to be I was trying to be nice to it. So anyway, really quickly, funny today um, when I get back from home, I have a pamphlet on my door from the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Invited, and it's just what the date is Monday, Monday, April fourteenth, two thousand fourteen. Uh, I'm invited to um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, so oh, okay. I would be going to that because that's no, not, that's no, not over, but, no. I would be, I would be, uh, I'd be celebrating the Passover and then. Uh, I must uh, uh, unease the bread at that time. They came by so that I yeah. could then they would have been coming to me. <laughs> yeah, that's that really good. <laughs> yeah, that, that, see, that's, and that's exactly what you uh, you can do. If you uh, are interested in me responding to what the points your your mother may have made in the text message, mm-hmm. you're more than welcome to uh, send it to me. It's uh, anybody that's listening to this program and, and would prefer to communicate via email, and I'll, I'll gladly respond to emails. I did the first hour of this program today. Uh, it's yada okay. at yada yada.com. Yada at okay. yada yada.com will come directly to me, and I'm more than happy to uh, to try to respond to uh, emails. And what, what you're basically saying here, uh, Daniel, is that uh, your mother doesn't want to hear anything that is uh, in conflict with her faith, and that well, it makes her uncomfortable. Yeah, oh, yeah. She had invited me to, um, she said, we're having a Seder meal on Friday the 18th. You and my girlfriend are invited. She said, we're not doing it at the church this year because there's too many people going there. And he suggested for people who've already been probably, that's what I'm assuming, I didn't get to that point, but for them to do it at home, you know, and have people over. Yeah, so the, moment you hear a, the, the moment you hear Seder, you know that this yeah. is going to be a rabbinic, a religious yeah. presentation. Yeah. The rabbis don't get it any more accurate than do the pretend uh, messianic type uh, Christians. And so, you don't, you don't want to go to a seder. Uh, you celebrate uh, Pesach following uh, Yahushua's, uh, uh, Yahweh's instructions, and uh, and it's really very simple. And you don't, go, you don't want the word seder automatically just screams. This yeah. is going to be a rabbinical religious celebration. Don't go there. And it's on Friday the 18th, which is kind of only a few <laughs> days later. But, uh, <laughs> they don't even get the time right. <laughs> oh, good grief. Well, well uh, Daniel, thank you. Uh, send me the text message if there's something you'd like me to respond to. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that you are not going to have to set that appointment and, uh, and meet with the pastor. It would have been a miserable experience for everyone involved, and nothing would have been gained. May y'all bless you all. Look forward to being with you tomorrow. <laughs>